Hey guys, give me a second. I'm going to try to uh, fix this thing here. Thank you. So we just have a little bit of technical issues. Yeah. So um, what happened was, is that you're um, under that brand viv on the right hand side, there was an overlay, which was that slide deck at the beginning. And yeah. it was, it was over top of your image. So that's why you couldn't see it. Oh, I see. So I right. just took the overlay off. Okay. And then I'm going to go under banners and uh, so you have this banner here. Where is that hide current banner? Okay. So that's your full deck there. How does that look? That's great. Okay. That's much better. Thank you. Sorry about the technical hiccup. So well, let's, uh, let's begin our session, shall we? So basically, we are very lucky to have invited Dr. Some of Manoj. You are frozen. Am I frozen? Is it cold? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we are very lucky tonight to have invited Dr. Manoj Kamaka and Dr. Ranjith Sivakuma all the way from Hong Kong uh, to talk to us about the Astro News article on costal clavicular brachial plexus block. So let me, um, well, basically, first of all, my name is Vivian Ip, and I am from the University of Alberta in Canada. And I am also the editor of the Astro Pain Medicine News. And, uh, and so I'll let, uh, first of all, Professor Manoj Kamaka to introduce himself. Uh, good, good evening. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in this wonderful world. I'm Anuj Karmakar from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Vivian, Kwesi, and uh, Chris for inviting me to this session, and in particular, Azra. Uh, so uh, what can I say? I'm just Manoj Karmakar, and uh, I'm here to, to, to try and uh, discuss with you why costoclavicular brachial plexus block may be a good technique to use. Thank you. Great. And uh, Dr. Ranjit Sivakuma, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, Dr. Vivian, and hi, others. I'm Dr. Ranjit. Uh, I'm a Oops. Uh, hello? Yes, yeah, I think we can hear you. Can you yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Actually, there's a lot of echo here. I keep... Oh, right. uh, I we can keep... hear you pretty good. Oh, okay. Oh, so I'm a, uh, I'm a clinical uh, fellow and uh, visiting scholar working with Professor Kamaka. That's fantastic. Do you have two screens up? Is that one on your phone or one on the laptop? Sometimes that can give some echo. You're good, Ranjit. Come on, keep going. We can we can hear you. We Pretty can good. hear you well. There's no echo on our end. No, yeah. I, I, I keep repeating. Uh, so I keep repeating my own voice. At least twice. It might be your time. microphone. Yeah. Maybe you can just speak and just kind of ignore the echo because we can use the, uh, the webcam. Don't you don't need the your microphone. Yeah, just use the webcam. Oh, oh, oh yes, I have disconnected my. Yeah, now you're okay. Webcam, don't, okay. You don't need the, your microphone. Yeah, keep going. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now you're okay. Yeah. Now good. But see, I think that's a little bit of a delay there. Yeah. But see, I think Is that me? <laughs> that's about like a two minute delay. <laughs> I can see what your problem was. <laughs> now. <laughs> I don't know, from our perspective, it almost seemed better when you had the 
Yeah, you may have to put the microphone back. You may have to put the earphone back. Yeah, Ranjith, I think. Oh, Ranjith is frozen. Well, let's, um, okay, let's have. Ranjith, are you with us? Yes, 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 yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So you, you work with uh, Dr. Kamaka. Yes. I've been working with Professor Kamaka for more than two years. Perfect. Wow. That must be, that. that's fantastic. That's great. You must be learning loads. All right, so um, let's uh, let's have Chris, um, uh, Doctor Chris, show that introduce himself. All right, hello, Chris. I'm Chris. Uh, I work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, and just happy to be here and learning from you guys. And Doctor Kwesi Kofi. Hi, I'm Kwesi Kofi. I'm from uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and I run the Regional Anesthesia and Acute Pain Service uh, here, and I. It's a great pleasure to be here. Honored to be uh, um, to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody for being here. And in fact, Chris was the, the when Chris was the editor for Astro News, um, he actually started this Facebook Live session, which I think is is actually really good to actually be able to discuss with the author um, about the you know inner thoughts and and for example, um, now Dr. Kamaka, you you start writing about cost of curricular block in two thousand and fifteen. What inspired you to, you know, to have this idea to, you know, kind of, you know, develop this cultural, uh, Oshanga, the cultural curricular block? What inspired you? They say adversity is the mother of invention. <laughs> now, uh, when you look at um, infraclavicular brachial plexus block, it's always traditionally been to do a lateral sagittal infraclavicular block at the second part of the axillary artery. And uh, although we were very familiar with it, I found that in clinical practice, when you wanted a, a very rapid turnover and you were using it for surgical anesthesia, then it really didn't fit the bill because uh, it would have a variable onset. You'd have a very slow onset of the block and sometimes surgical anesthesia would take a while to set in. Now, if you're using it for analgesia, you probably would not um, experience this difficulty. But when you're using it, particularly for surgical anesthesia, then uh, it becomes a problem. Second, we also found um, over the years, uh, when you put uh, uh, an inter uh, infraclavicular catheter, it is traditional to put it at the posterior aspect of the second part of the axillary artery. While your primary blocks work very well because you're using a relatively large volume, with time when you're infusing smaller volumes, we used to get, um, you know, um, I used to get uh, feedbacks from the pain nurses and the acute pain service that over after some time, after a while in, in day one or so, you would see recession of the primary block and then you'll have, um, uh, you'll have secondary block failure in, in certain uh, territories of the, of, the, of the brachial plexus. So um, really, I, I, I revisited uh, some of the anatomy of the brachial plexus and thought, you know, there must be some other way to, do, to deliver this uh, uh, approach so that you could have rapid onset and you could uh, provide surgical anesthesia more consistently. Uh, and in my travels, uh, I was very fortunate to have met uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Grau, uh, and at that time, uh, Thomas was in, uh, in, in, obviously in Germany, and I think it was in um, Heidelberg or somewhere. He, he was doing a workshop, and uh, I was just watching, and uh, he, he performed a scan just below the clavicle, and, uh, uh, and voila, I just saw something that I had never seen before, or something that uh, we, we rarely perform scans in an area just periclavicular, periinfraclavicular, if you may. So thereafter, I, I reviewed some of the literature and I found that, as you are all familiar, that at the, um, at the lateral sagittal infraclavicular fossa, and depending on the body habitus of individual, the, the cause can be relatively deep, uh, you know, compared to a supraclavicular. So sometimes when we are using the ultrasound machines, you really can't see all the three cords of the brachial plexus. 
in a single sagittal sonogram of the brachial of the of the of the area. Furthermore, I think there are a lot of anatomical variations in this area, and the position of the cord varies with the position of the arm, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I was very fortunate also to see that in the radiology literature, there was an article by a group from France, uh, Demondian uh, and colleagues, where they had performed uh, scans of the brachial plexus from the from the cervical nerve roots, uh, so the roots of the brachial plexus all the way down to the periphery. And in one of those um, sonograms, although they, albeit they did it in a sagittal plane, but they demonstrated all the three cords of the brachial plexus. So all we did was we just uh, performed a transverse scan in the same area, and that became the transverse sonogram that we use today. And costoclavicular is uh, a space per se was really not well defined at the time, because it's uh, at the uh, apex of the uh, of the um, you know between the neck and the and the axilla, I suppose, at the apex of the axilla. So uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Sala Blanche in, in in Barcelona, and we did some cadaver dissections, and we then found that it was really a, an ideal site because. The three cords were clustered together, and even in our cadaver dissections, we found that the anatomy was very consistent uh, with the lateral cord being the most superficial, uh, posterior to that being the medial cord, which is just next to the artery, and then laterally you had the uh, you had the posterior cord. So, so there started the journey of you know performing injections and, and so on and so forth. So hopefully that gives you some insight into how. We came about uh, the idea of uh, performing costoclavicular brachial plexus block. But that said, uh, this is not something that is uh, a, a very new technique. There's always a saying that if you look hard enough, you'll find somebody has done something like this before. Uh, so I, I always say to um, people like Ranjit that when you write a paper, don't say that this is the first time or this is um, this is the first report because. It all means that you haven't looked hard enough. In any case, um, there was a technique called the Kilka approach, if many of you are, are familiar with it. Kilka was from, I think it was from Germany, and uh, in, the, in the German literature, they had described uh, performing uh, nerve stimulator-guided uh, brachial plexus uh, in the, uh, just uh, lateral to the subclavian artery, uh, in, in just below the in midpoint of the, uh, of the clavicle below the clavicle uh, in the infraclavicular area where they inserted a needle pretty much like a vertical uh, which eventually became the vertical infraclavicular brachial plexus block so you insert the needle uh, almost vertically uh, anterior posteriorly and then you elicit uh, motor response and uh, a lot of literature was there at the time that this technique really produced very rapid onset of uh, sensory motor blockade uh, faster than an axillary block, faster than an infraclavicular brachial plexus block. So uh, that really uh, was some of the background as to how we uh, started our journey on this uh, technique. That's great. Thank you very much for outlining the journey for like the the birth of the costoclavicular block. So now, Dr. Ranjit, in your clinical practice, how, like, in what situation would you use that block? And would you put catheters in? Yes. Um, most often, uh, we would use costoclavicular brachial plexus block uh, for uh, cases uh, or surgeries that involve uh, lesions below the midpoint of the humerus. So for... Um, distal humerus fracture surgeries, elbow surgeries, or uh, hand or forearm surgeries. And also, uh, this is our technique uh, of choice uh, when it comes to, or if we need to place a brachial plexus catheter. Because uh, the catheter stays, uh, since the costoclavicular space is between the uh, muscles, like uh, pectoralis major, subclavius, and serratus, the catheter tends to stay better, and it's uh, since it's not at the level of the neck, so when the patient moves their head, uh, it, it tends not to move much. So it's our uh, technique of choice for uh, when it comes to um, uh, catheter placement. 
Well, thank you. Now, um, Dr. Schroeder has a case study for us to perhaps discuss the use and um, and the tips and pearls of of using this block. So yeah. So um, I actually kind of set this up as being performed in the setting of shoulder surgery. Um, I don't know. Does that sound okay for you guys? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So imagine a 74 year old woman who's presenting for a left total shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, let's just say she has a BMI of 27 and a history of some hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, uh, but also some oxygen dependent COPD for which she's on two liters nasal cannula at home. So the general, your surgical team is asking for general anesthesia and just an interscaling nerve block as is typical in your institution. You know, what, when you are in your clinical practice, you know, what are your standard criteria for not performing interscaling nerve block or, you know, considering some other type of regional anesthesia procedure? Well, that's a nice uh, clinical scenario you placed, Chris. Okay, um, given that this uh, elderly woman has um, her needs uh, shoulder arthroplasty, she has uh, some compromised respiratory function, uh, and she has COPD, uh, it would be prudent not to do interscalene, obviously, that we know. It's interscalene would be contraindicated. Now, obviously, you have to use a, a phrenic nerve sparing alternative for, for this kind of, of, of surgery. Now, um, while costoclavicular may be one of the approaches that you may use, but uh, I need to ask you, are you using this? Obviously, you're going to use this for surgical anesthesia. Is that right? Uh, only for analgesic purposes. So the okay. standard in your institution is just to do a general anesthetic. Okay. So if you're going to use it for analgesia, then I suppose costoclavicular would be a, a good option in this case. Now, if you want alternative uh, phrenic nerve sparing um, techniques, then you have to use a, a hybrid approach in the sense you either combine a lateral sagittal infraclavicular with a anterior suprascapular nerve block or a posterior suprascapular nerve block. So therefore, uh, you have this issue that when one of the blocks or the other wears out, then the patient's going to have um, pain. But costoclavicular is emerging as an alternative technique for shoulder surgery. And there are some reports by groups from Canada, by Dr. Tran and them uh, demonstrating that it is uh, it, it provides non-inferior analgesia to interscalene, but at the same time, it may be, um, it may have no or very minimal uh, hemidiaphragmatic uh, paresis following uh, costoclavicular. Also, there are some good anatomical um, dissection studies by Dr. Koela Mundi and uh, their group. I think they are somewhere from Arizona, I suppose. Uh, and they have demonstrated that a single injection at the center of the nerve cluster, as we had originally described, not only affects the three codes, but there's also a cranial spread to affect the, the three trunks of the brachial plexus, including the suprascapular nerve. So now uh, that is very interesting because uh, that amounts to complete anesthesia of the upper extremity apart from the uh, intercostal brachial area. Now, although this is not clinically validated as of today, but I think it has the potential. And if it has been shown to be non-inferior to, to interscalene for shoulder surgery, then I think the suprascapular nerve does play a part, apart from the fact that the lateral pectoral and other nerves from the brachial plexus axillary nerves are also uh, are affected by the by the by the costoclavicular block. And as Ranjit mentioned, uh, it is our uh, favorite site for catheter placement because you can place the catheter at the center of the nerve cluster, and uh, we use um, again. I have no financial interest. Uh, that's my declaration. We use the uh, catheter over needle um, systems for our continuous uh, techniques, so much so that uh, we place the tip of the needle where we want the catheter to lie. And thereafter, you can um, remove the, stylet, the needle, introduce the um, obturator, and uh, maintain an infusion. Uh, and because the catheter is uh, at the center of the cluster, 
uh, you need relatively small volumes of local anesthetics. And we find that it provides relatively good um, continued pain relief for upper extremity surgery below the elbow. Now, we haven't validated this for shoulder surgery, uh, but uh, it would seem like if you use it for shoulder surgery, you may need a slightly larger volume because you need to continue that spread kefilad. And what that magic number is, I have no idea. Would that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you anecdotally that we've had yes. uh, a number of patients where we try to avoid an interscaling block and, you know, instead have tried, you know, either an isolated axillary with a suprascapular nerve block and been left somewhat disappointed. And on a couple of occasions, at least, we've rescued it with a costoclavicular block and they've done phenomenally well. I don't know. Do you guys have any experience, you know, Questy, using this for shoulder surgery at all? Uh, yes, we have done a few cases. I wouldn't say that we do a lot of shoulder surgery um, for the sessions that I do now. Uh, but yes, I think there is um, anatomical, uh, the anatomical principles do, uh, you know, support the use in shoulder surgery. It is only a matter of time that more, um, more research data uh, will support this. But I think if you look at anatomically, yes, uh, and I've alluded to some of that. So you have the potential for the local anesthetic to spread to most of the nerves that are uh, involved with afrenociception from the shoulder. You'd look at the axillary nerve. You have the um, suprascapular nerve. Yes, it has to spread cranially. Uh, then you have uh, uh, whatever the SAIL uh, parts, the lateral pectoral nerve, and uh, uh, one of the other nerves from the so sub subscapularis nerve. Yes. So all these nerves come from the uh, from the cords of the brachial plexus. So you you are right at the uh, epicenter, I suppose. Uh, where you can deliver a small volume of local anesthetic and produce analgesia for the shoulder. That said, uh, we when we uh, set out on our journey on this costoclavicular block, it never really dawned on me that we would use it for shoulder surgery uh, because our uh, our problems were different and we were aiming it more for, uh, for a, a technique that would give us consistent, repeatable, reliable surgical anesthesia that would be... Um, faster in onset and, and more consistent using smaller volumes. Uh, and you know that our patients are relatively smaller than in body habitus than um, you guys uh, uh, experience. And for us, uh, between, say, our average body um, BMI is 25, 24, something like that. So we use somewhere between 20 to 25 mils of local anesthesia. When we use it for surgical anesthesia, uh, we use 25 because that's the ED95 we've, we've determined. And we find that within 20, 25 minutes, the patients are consistently, you know, uh, have a complete sensory motor blockade of the four terminal nerves. And that's that's good. Do you feel, I, I just had a bit of a follow-up question. Do you find that, yeah. um, that patients reliably um, get... Um, motor impairment for the shoulder. Certainly some patients, even when you're doing lower extremity surgery, some patients that have impairment um, pain associated with the, the shoulder sometimes need some sort of block of the, the axillary nerve uh, in particular to be able to allow abduction of the shoulder even for, um, for distal upper extremity surgery. Do you find that you get that reliably? Or have you ever looked um, at it? No, we haven't really looked at it, and I don't recall there ever being a problem. Uh, now that you asked me the question, maybe I'll look at it more closely next time, but uh, I I don't recall, you know, that the, the surgeon or the patient complaining ever. So especially when you're doing um, distal, uh, distal hand or arm surgery, uh, forearm surgery. Yeah, I do. I do this block quite a lot um, since your description, and I find that I, you know, I know I know that's the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment, but I find that you know even with single shot or catheter, I just go in between, and that's all good. Like, do you do you really have to go, you know, subparaneural or like 
within the compartment and how many injections do you recommend or just like that single injection which is why i do it because it's so simple and yeah uh yeah that's a good question uh, vivian uh yes i think there is the the circumneural sheet or the perineural sheet um as uh, we know today they are uh, it is a all encompassing sheet actually it not only includes surrounds the cords but also the neurovascular the the axillary artery and the vein uh, it's very it's more dense towards closer to the cords and uh, it's less organized more distally now the uh, it organizes itself to produce an anterior and a posterior compartment because there's a septum between the lateral cord and the posterior compartment elements which is the uh, medial and the posterior cord. Um, now, in our original description, when I set out, I said, oh, well, if we have three cords and I can find a way to put my needle safely into the center of the cluster, then the word I often use, this is the epicenter, you know, and then now if you put your local anesthetic, it's going to spread um, from inward to outward or whatever, and it'll produce its uh, sensory motile block. Now, having now defined this anterior and posterior compartment, uh, yes, it, um, it kind of intuitively makes you say that, oh, well, you need to do two injections at least, one in the anterior compartment and one in the posterior compartment to produce rapid onset of block. But actually, the randomized studies uh, both from Canada and, and some folks from uh, in China have shown that actually whether you do two injections or three injections, you get a marginal improvement in the onset time, but the overall block dynamics will remain the same. Now, this is not difficult to explain because the, 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 this, the, the collagen fibers are, are multi-layered. They're very thin. Now, what we think is a sheath is not like a bed sheet. It is a a, a conglomeration of uh, multiple layers of collagen fibers that come together when you inject the local anesthetic. You understand what I'm saying? So they're all loosely organized. And when you inject the local anesthetic, they coil together. Put it this way. They come together and form a, now a thicker, a thicker layer of connective tissue, which becomes apparent in the ultrasound image. That's why it's more easier to see this sheet or the compartments after you've injected and I'm, I'm confident many of you have experienced this in your in your clinical practice so if you're going to do a block then you may not be able to see the two compartments you may not be able to see the sheet and it depends also on the system that you are using but i think a a, a simple way to do it is now we know that the anterior compartment contains the lateral cord and the posterior compartment contains the medial and the posterior cord. So if you place your one injection next to the, or close to the medial cord, and as you're withdrawing the needle, place a little bit of local anesthesia next to the lateral cord, it's the way I, I do it now. But I'm, I can't say for sure whether that would be uh, the way to go because even a single injection in the center would produce an equally effective uh, block for clinical practice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for outlining that. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. And now, Dr. Ranjith, so now tell me in your practice, do you have any, because I sometimes find that it's quite, it can be quite vascular, especially if you go a little bit too far down. Um, yeah. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the you know the tips and pearls and and things to watch out for? Yes. Uh, so actually, uh, when we perform a costoclavicular brachial plexus block, uh, we have a routine. So we start uh, placing a transducer over the clavicle first and just slide it down. So once we slide it down, um, most often we encounter the uh, cephalic vein that arches over the cords. Uh, to join the axillary vein, so uh, that would be, but that would be at the uh, medial infraclavicular fossa. So, in order to avoid this, what we do is, once we slide the transducer down from the clavicle, we make a cephalid uh, tilt. 
so that we directly look under the clavicle but not uh, at the medial infraclavicular fossa. So at this point, uh, we would not see the cephalic vein. Uh, so when we go even below than the cephalic vein, we would see thoracoacromian artery, but that would be too low for a costoclavicular brachial plexus block. So what we do is uh, we start from the clavicle, we slide down, and we tilt the clavicle cephalic to directly look under the clavicle. Uh, that would be the costoclavicular space uh, that has all the all three cords clustered together, just lateral to the axillary artery. Uh, I think you're muted, uh, Vivian. Yes, somebody has to do it one time. <laughs> so now what we, I mean, I was trying to show like your beautiful diagram. You have so many figures to try to, you know, um, to show how you do the blocks and it's, it's just fantastic uh, diagrams. So yeah, I, I find that um, Tilt in the Probe actually does help as you, as you say, yeah. I think uh, one of the things uh, I often, um, uh, see when um, beginners do this is uh, is they don't actually uh, insonate the costoclavicular space. Now, uh, when you are looking at the costoclavicular space, I always say it is imperative, and the word imperative is important, is that you should be visualizing the subclavius muscle. When you are insonating the medial infraclavicular fossa, that is the most proximal part of the infraclavicular fossa, if you may, distal to the costoclavicular space, does not have the uh, subclavius muscle. So mm -hmm. you at the costoclavicular space, you have the clavicular head of pectoralis major and the subclavius anteriorly, and posteriorly you have the uh, serratus magnum, which is the upper slip of the serratus anterior muscle, overlying the second rib. Now, the second rib is also important because, yes, that's the picture. Now, when you see the ultrasound image, uh, again, uh, you first of all, you have to see the subclavius, as you can see here. Second is you want to see a very sharp border of the, of the, um, of the serratus magnum or the serratus anterior muscle. Now, when you, when you see a sharp border of the serratus anterior muscle, uh, whether you tilt it or or uh, or incline the uh, tilt the transducer until the anterior border of the serratus muscle is becomes very well delineated at this point you will often see that the three cords are, are best visualized because the beam is now at right angles to the serratus and it is going right through the three cords and hopefully um, it is uh, at right angle now if you if you if after having done these uh, maneuvers, if you still find that you can't see the cords, um, it is uh, a tip is to try and you pivot the probe, the medial end of the probe slightly cordially. The objective is to try and place the transducer at right angles to the cords, and thereby you will start to see the cords much better. So these are two important uh, tips that you would like to keep in mind. One is you need to see a, a clear view of the subclavius muscle. Two is a sharp edge of the serratus anterior will always make visualizing the cords easier. And third is if you still find it difficult uh, to visualize the three cords, then pivot the medial end of the uh, transducer. And this usually help. Uh, if you still can't see it, I'm afraid it's not going to be possible to visualize <laughs> the three cords down. Yeah, thank you. Now, um, um, let me just interrupt a little bit because um, if the audience, I'd like to say, if the audience want to post any questions, please uh, put them in the comments and we can address them uh, towards the end of the discussion. So please post your questions in the comment box. Yeah, I think that's a very good tip. And I have to say, one time I was trying this block on a very obese patient, you know, BMI of 45. And just as long as you know the landmarks and what to look for, the subclavius, 
is actually really quite easy, I have to say, mm -hmm. even for obese individuals. So I, I'm actually quite a fan of this block. And I like putting cactus in because it actually, it does anchor it very well compared to, say, superclavicular blocks. Um, because we do a lot of um, fingering reimplantation at our institution. And so that I, I think that is actually a very good block because for infraclavicular blocks, it's it can be quite deep, right? Um, especially if you, you know, faced with high BMI patients and that can be quite challenging and, you know, trying to uh, block all the, all the cords. So, yes, I think. Yeah, I, so I, I think because it's, uh, it's relatively superficial. So in relative terms, if you have an obese individual uh, they're not going to have a lot of fat just below the clavicle, put it this way. So uh, you will find it much easier to visualize it. But then even then I find you're not going to get a crisp image like in most situations. Uh, but as you said, as you alluded to, uh, if you know the normal anatomy within those uh, ultrasound uh, images, you can still uh, delineate the, the neural anatomy much, much clearly. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, one thing is that uh, when we do costoclavicular block, as um, we'd originally described, the arm must be abducted. Uh, the arm must be abducted 90 degrees because, oh, I'm not saying exactly 90 degrees, it's got to be abducted comfortably so that the patient can comfortably abduct it to the point. It's because you need some space on the lateral edge of the transducer to insert your needle. With the arm adducted, uh, you will find it more difficult to insert the needle from the lateral aspect. And uh, abducting the arm also opens out the uh, costoclavicular space, I think, in, in some respect. It stretches the subclavius and um, maybe makes the anatomy more, uh, more approachable and more easily delineated. So keep the arm abducted. Um, if you have the arm abducted, then you will find the transverse scan very difficult. Uh, from especially uh, if you insert the needle from a lateral to medial aspect. Uh, a medial approach has been described by Dr. Salablanche and their group uh, in patients where you can't insert the needle from the from the from the lateral aspect. Are you muted, Vivian? Thank you. So uh, we have another question from the audience. So can costoclavicular brachial plexus block be used on an obese patient easier than an infraclavicular block? I think we've partly covered that. Or is the axillary block, brachial plexus block, better to use in this case? I mean, I think there are pros and cons. Um, I'll, I'll let um, uh, Josh Kamaka or Josh Ranjith answer that uh i mean you, i guess uh, bearing in mind it, yeah. yeah 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 i think uh, it all depends on many things but i think uh, if it is a it's a morbidly obese individual a, 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 a simple easier option is always the best way to go especially if you're doing a, a hand surgery uh, and you don't want to put you don't you don't have a requirement to put a catheter then i think an auxiliary approach would be would be desirable because it's much easier, uh, much superficial, and you would uh, you are away from um, most of the vital structures. Costoclavicular in uh, obese individuals uh, can be easier than an infraclavicular, but getting an optimal image in the obese individual of the costoclavicular space is still a challenge. So um, you got to weigh your pros and cons, and you got to weigh your experience, and uh, and do what you think is best. But if you're going to put a catheter, then again, you have to <laughs> see where you get the best image of, uh, of, the, of the cords of the brachial plexus. And Costoclavia, as uh, Vivian alluded to, uh, and obviously she has more experience in this respect with doing it in the obese individual, uh, it is possible to do them. Uh, and you may find it easy to place the catheter in, uh, in, at the center of the cluster. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, especially with the anticoagulation um, or anticoagulated patients, I guess, you know, costocopicular may not be that great because you can't compress it. 
Um, so in that case, if you're doing single shot, then maybe axillary brachial plexus might be better. Um, now, I have another question from Harry. Uh, when technically challenging to do costoclavicular block, what would the authors choose as the next best alternative for brachial plexus? Hi, Harry. That's a good question. I think uh, as, uh, as you very rightly uh, pointed out, um, no technique is uh, not challenging. There are times when you will find it challenging. Now, if uh, costoclavicular is uh, difficult, either because of uh, the anatomy or inadequacy of uh, being able to visualize the target anatomy, then you'll have to choose the next best alternative. And you, if you're doing, um, for those uh, who are uh, beginners, if you're doing more distal surgery, then an auxiliary approach would be desirable or even an infraclavicular. So just because we are talking about costoclavicular doesn't mean that we've discounted lateral sagittal infraclavicular approach. It can be a good approach, but uh, do remember that you may need multiple injections. I mean, you've got to chase each of the individual cords, uh, or you have to use larger volumes of local anesthetic than a costoclavicular. Now, the costoclavicular, therefore, as, uh, has this advantage that because you're injecting at the cluster where the local anesthetic can access the three nerves um, uh, in, you know, in a closed closed area. Uh, also allows you to inject relatively smaller volumes of local anesthetic. So um, this this would be how I would approach a person with a, with a distal arm or a distal distal surgery. All right, thank you. Now, I think the next question is similar. It says, you know, going through the points when deciding between uh, costoclavicular versus infraclavicular. And we have one more question um, about nerve injury. Is nerve injury greater with costoclavicular block than with infraclavicular block? I think that's a very good question. Now, when your nerves are clustered together, there is a greater potential for needle nerve contact. That's for sure. Uh, it is for this reason when you do costoclavicular, and we've already reported this, and in fact, Dr. Tran's group has also reported that there's a very high incidence of paresthesia uh, during block placement. Now, if, um, if you um, look at the literature, needle uh, nerve contact may often uh, lead to uh, inflammatory changes in, in, in animal models and so on and so forth. So that may be considered as some degree of nerve injury. But uh, from our extensive experience and the published literature, although the incidence of paresthesia is high, and this is also in agreement with many other techniques that have reported paresthesia, that long-term neurological sequelae is, is very rare. Occasionally, you may find the odd patient who may have um, some sensory... Um, uh, some changes in the distal part of the arm, but they usually resolve. <clears throat> and I can only recall one or two patients. Now, that said, because you brought out this issue of nerve injury, um, I like to just share some experience about this very compactness of the, of the cords. Uh, in some patients, when uh, particularly the slim ones that we deal with, we can see that the cords are really uh, compact. There are two anatomical facts you've got to keep in mind. One is that the medial and the posterior cord are often very closely opposed together. Uh, in cadaver models, we have had to even dissect the connective tissue between the posterior and the middle cord, medial cord. So what that, in clinical terms, it means that never try to put your needle between the medial and the posterior cord that will be inviting putting a needle into one of the other one of the other cords so what do you do when you have a very compact cord and you find that the um, in want of a better word the cleavage between the lateral and the posterior cord is is not very well defined then use hydrodissection saline or dextrose is your friend so i often use saline as you as you go through the subclavius muscle and you are just, uh, you know, you've just traversed the, uh, the, the or you've just penetrated the uh, 
subclavius muscle, inject a small amount of, of saline. Uh, you're looking for two things. One is, if you see the nerves being pushed away, that usually implies you're, you're not subfascial. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Because these three cords are actually surrounded by the circumneural sheath. And inherently, uh, a costoclavicular block is a subfascial injection at the center of the nerve cluster between the lateral, with the needle advanced between the lateral and the posterior cord, as you can see in the uh, image B uh, on your top right. So if you inject saline and you see the lateral and the, and the posterior cord pushed away, that means you're still a little bit away from being subfascial. So then you slowly advance your needle till you see what you're seeing in frame number C. That means now you're seeing the spread of the local between the lateral and the posterior cord, and the medial cord is uh, right in front of your tip of your needle. And this is as far as you probably need to advance the needle because now you're subfascial. You're bet you've gone between the lateral and the medial cord. And uh, you, if once you inject your local anesthetic, you will create this distension of the subparaneural compartment of the, um, of the costoclavicular space. And uh, then you have more space to play with and uh, reposition your needle either closer to the medial cord or closer to the lateral cord. So this, this goes a long way in um, facilitating safe delivery of the needle at the target site. Yeah, that's, um, that's, thank you very much for the granular explanation that, um, now I've got a question about, you know, w would the block still work if you just go lateral to the posterior cord? Uh, would an injection single just lateral to the posterior cord work for an effective block? Uh, uh, I hazard to say that, uh, yes, it will work. But I think uh, on a consistent basis, it would not work. So you may be lucky on a Monday, but on a Tuesday, you may not be so lucky. So uh, if you want consistent block, then you need to, in principle, and as anatomy would dictate, is that you either inject the center of the cluster uh, or you uh, inject the individual cords. Now, I know where you're coming from. You say you have a difficult situation here where I can't uh, advance the needle or you don't think it's safe to advance the needle between the lateral and the medial cord because you've done hydrodissection, etc. cetera. Then uh, you can definitely try coming from a lateral aspect of the posterior cord and uh, because the connective tissue elements are relatively loose lateral to the cords, so if you are subparaneural, you may see it may allow you some uh, some some uh, leeway for for maneuvering the needle, if I may use that word, uh, to hopefully place it, the local uh, because you are now lateral to the posterior cord, you are in the posterior compartment, and then all you need is just put a bit of local anesthetic next to the lateral and. I think that should that should work in most cases. Fantastic. Now, is there any other question? I don't see any other questions in the comment box. Any anything else from the panel? Um, uh, Prof, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, to take us back to the question that Dr. Chris asked in the beginning. Uh, for that case where uh, we have to provide analgesia for the shoulder surgery. Uh, is it a better option to do a small volume superior trunk block? Because a superior trunk block is formed by C5 and C6. And all the nerves that supply the shoulder, like uh, axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, upper subscapular, um, and suprascapular nerve, all these nerves, uh, they go through the superior trunk, that is C5 and C6. So we need not uh, separately block the axillary nerve or lateral pectoral nerve at a lower level. But if we block at the level of C5, C6, that is the superior trunk, uh, we would be blocking all these four nerves. And since it's only for analgesia, uh, would it be OK with uh, small volume or high concentrated uh, local anesthetic to provide a better analgesia? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, 
There are two other issues here. One is uh, Chris's patient has respiratory um, compromise, uh, COPD. And uh, I think it is prudent here in this case is to try and avoid any form of uh, hemidiaphragmatic uh, paresis. Mm. While a superior trunk block was originally described to try and um, maybe negate this problem, but actually there's growing evidence now that although it provides non-inferior analgesia, it still can cause relatively um, high incidence of, uh, of uh, hemidiaphragmatic uh, paresis somewhere between 40 to 80 percent. So that is pretty much like an interscaline. And it's, it's easy to understand because even small volumes of local anesthetic at the interscaling groove, at the position, at the location where the superior trunk is formed, uh, can produce uh, hemidiaphragmatic paresis. Now, coming to the question of a low volume, low dose, today we really don't know what an optimal dose or volume of uh, local anesthetic or what the ED95 of, uh, of a given local anesthetic is for the superior trunk block. I would hazard if you gave, uh, if your back is against the wall and you have no other choice and you are going to bite the bullet, then maybe I'd inject slowly two to three cc's and that should provide adequate analgesia, especially given that uh, you're going to uh, provide a general anesthetic and maybe support the respiratory system for for at least an hour or two while the surgery is on and uh, and then uh, it should be um, it should be okay to to extubate the patient or you know recover the patient from the general anesthetic that would be the way uh, I would look at it so when you do costoclavicular uh, you are somehow uh, at the same time you are overcoming some of these issues uh, uh, whereas um, the super superior trunk block, although uh, an attractive option, uh, you have to weigh those uh, risks and benefits. Thank you. Now, one last question I have. Um, yeah, sometimes I find that too, the Krakow process gets in the way. Um, any tips for that? Uh, the coracoid process gets in the way because you are inserting your needle too low. Okay. Uh, when you do a costoclavicular brachial plexus block, the coracoid process is nowhere uh, in, the, in the vicinity, my friend. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, it, when you perform the scan, keep the arm abducted uh, and uh, perform the scan where you can see the subclavius muscle. Uh, and if your arm is abducted, the coracoid process will definitely be in the way. So, it's possible, conceivable that maybe in that situation, you were, your arm was abducted. So keep the arm abducted, and uh, you will find it's rarely in the in the in the way. Well, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate Dr. Kamka and Dr. Ranjit to come here to discuss with us and share the tips and pearls about the costal clavicular brachial plexus block. And we certainly have lots of possible uh, positive comments from Harry and Dahlia saying how excellent this article is, very helpful, really, really great, um, you know, with fantastic images and really granular discussion about how to successfully do this block. So I thank you all for coming and thank you um, for all the audience for joining us. Sorry about the initial technical challenges, but we got through this and, uh, and I think that's a wonderful evening and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy uh, the rest of the evening and we'll see you soon in person, I hope. Yes, absolutely.